Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you look right over here, what is written there? Breakspear since 1982. And uh, I know Dr. Monroe since 1985, so probably three years after that. I think Alistair was almost a teenager or a baby when I met uh, uh, Dr. Monroe. So uh, we are all were part of American Academy Environmental Medicine, which uh, put so much emphasis on the role of environmental factors. If I will ask you one question, what was the take home message from Dr. Muhammad's presentation? Just one word. I think the trigger, environmental trigger. That was really the home take message. So I'm going to continue talking about environmental triggers, but not about the infection. Another environmental trigger, which is chemicals, toxic chemicals. You see the rubber duck, right? OK, so what is the role of environmental chemicals in autoimmune diseases? Uh, so again, thank you very much for your presentation. You made my life much, much easier. But what is autoimmunity, which is uh, a process by which uh, the immune system reacts against itself, but that, you know, that's unusual. Our immune system is made to react against foreign material, not against our own tissue. And so therefore, then we have to ask why, if the immune system attacking our own tissue, why? Always the answer will be something from the environment manage to get to our body, bind to our tissue, or due to some of the mechanisms explained earlier, cross-reactivity, mimicry, then our immune system is trying to attack that and then in the process is attacking our own tissue, which is highly abnormal. So this is one of the most important slides. If, uh, uh, you know, in the future, because this by itself could be just one hour presentation. I'm going to spend probably 30 seconds or one minute to explain this, that I'm coming from the 10th uh, International Congress of Autoimmune Disease, which was last week in Leipzig in Germany. 600 different presentations, but unfortunately only about 20 of them were dealing with the role of environmental triggers. So you see this proportion of, uh, you know, of the number of presentations. But at least we are thankful we had the opportunity to present about the role of environmental triggers in autoimmune di diseases. The meeting was organized by Professor Schoenfeld from Israel, and uh, who is the leader about the mosaic of autoimmunity the mosaic of autoimmunity, why he calls that the mosaic of autoimmunity. And here you can see all the components of involved, all different components involved in the induction of autoimmunities. So in the base, we have the gene right there, the genes. Yes, we, we understand the genes are involved in the induction of autoimmune disease. But genes by themselves are not responsible for induction of autoimmune diseases. Something from the environment. So therefore, could be vaccines right here. Hormonal factors mentioned earlier. Some people may have IgA deficiency, um, adjuvant, silicon, uh, some kind of oils. And then finally, in here, you see all the infectious agents, EBV, CMV, herpes 1, herpes 2, all of that. So that was covered very well by Dr. Muhammad. Now, the second one, right here, there are two lines right there, you see? From drugs, plastic material, heavy metals, aluminum, pesticides, and name it. So that's the second, this is the first factor, second environmental triggers. And the third one, everybody's talking about gluten. 
but there are many other food antigens can trigger autoimmune disease. And so casein, lectins, agglutinins, aquaporins, now we have evidence from literature that there are many other food antigens can induce autoimmunity. And so finally, because all of this together causing dysbiosis, leaky gut, leaky gut is becoming part of the autoimmune disease uh, development. And then finally, you see nutritional deficiency, vitamin D, D vitamin A, aryl hydrocarbon receptor. There are some foods that uh, containing that. And so therefore, if you see the A right here, the A, that stands for autoimmunity. So all these factors together playing a role in the induction of autoimmune diseases. So many autoimmune diseases, as was mentioned earlier again, many years of suffering. Um, uh, many years of or decades of suffering, and you, we, we got several examples of that. My own mother suffered from rheumatoid arthritis for many, many years. She suffered more than 45 years from rheumatoid arthritis, and this is her hand. From age 40 all the way to 87, she suffered from this disorder. So autoimmune can attack every single part of our body. The joints, the brain, the internal organs, and the skin. So every single part of our body could be the target of autoimmune disease. And uh, according to National Institutes of Health, where they did twin studies, they took identical twins. When they looked at them, if one will have arthritis, for example, what is the probability of the other one will have arthritis. In relation to arthritis, only 10%. In a case of type 1 diabetes, they took twins. If one had type 1 diabetes, what was the probability the second one will have type 1 diabetes? 50%, not 100%. So then they took 10% plus 50% divided by 2, they came to conclusion that genes are playing a role in one-third of the autoimmune diseases, the other two thirds are associated with environmental triggers. So we have to pay attention more to environmental triggers. Now, I'm sure also you know about this book, The Autoimmune Epidemics. Let's just read this part from uh, Dr. Hokey from Johns Hopkins University and also his colleague Noel Rose, which I met at the meeting, that he is the father of autoimmunity, thyroid autoimmunity, Noel Rose. So what they wrote in this book, that it takes the human body thousands of years to adapt to new environmental stress, mainly toxic chemicals. Yet, in a hundred years, we have dumped so many toxic substances into our environment that our immune system is being asked to differentiate between our own body and unrecognizable invaders nonstop, which our body much more likely to make a mistake than it was. So meaning if we have more chemicals coming, attacking your tissue, your immune system is going to make a mistake. So, and then they say, say, uh, a century ago, there are just so many more opportunities to make mistakes. And we, ha we, you know, we are preaching about this for almost 30, 40 years through the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. The chemicals and other environmental triggers are major contributors of autoimmune diseases. So what happened? Why the immune system make mistakes? Because we have this mechanism, these two mechanisms, oral tolerance versus central tolerance in place. Another meaning, the oral tolerance, we have to tolerate food, which is friendly to us, and also friendly bacteria. We should not react to those. 
And that's through this mechanism called oral tolerance. The second mechanism is central tolerance. In our thymus gland, where lymphocytes migrate to get their education, they migrate from bone marrow to the thymus to get their education. There, they have a computer within. They can differentiate between self versus non-self. Any white blood cells, lymphocytes, which have a receptor for not self, they have to migrate to the blood and different tissues where they stay there and protect us against foreign material, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. But any lymphocytes who carry receptors for self, they should get eliminated. So if this process breaks down, the result could be autoimmunity. And chemicals can, can contribute significantly to that computer to make a mistake. And so therefore, environmental triggers can cause abnormality at the level of oral tolerance, can cause abnormality at the level of central tolerance. And there are very important type of cells involved in this mechanism of induction of tolerance. So that's why I'm asking, what are the most important cells in our body? So Alistair, what do you think? What do you think? What are the three most important cells in our body? As a man, we'll say sperm, right? <laughs> so I'm just joking in here. So here, is it egg or sperm? Okay, They are very important, absolutely, because without those, we'll not be here. Right? The next, neurons. Absolutely, we need the brain, right? And then finally, the third one, which is not all many of you are familiar with, it's called regulatory T cells, to regulate the immune system. So when tolerance is induced in our body, these cells are playing a significant role in the induction of oral tolerance as well as in the induction of central tolerance. That's why I believe these are the three type of cells which are extremely, extremely important in our body. So this is a beautiful picture from science about a couple months ago. They explain, actually, how does the immune system can tolerate the food that we eat every day. A child is born and is building the immune system. And during that process, these are the T-Rex cells are going to be developed. And those T-Rex cells can suppress immune reaction against food and can suppress also immune reaction against friendly bacteria. And that's how we live in harmony with the food that we eat every day and with the friendly bacteria. So any breakdown in this process of immune tolerance can result in inflammation and autoimmunity. So this is the full article. Mucosal Immunology, published in Science 2016, a month ago. Dietary antigens limit mucosal immunity by inducing regulatory T cells in the small intestine. And one more time, we explained that this is, if this is regulatory T cells, which helping in induction of tolerance, but failure in oral tolerance, and lymphocyte activation, if you have too many cells get activated, the results of that could be inflammation, inflammatory disease, and then we react against self-antigens, which we are not supposed to do it under normal conditions. So this is the cell. One more time, I'm explaining why. So, because T-Rex cells, uh, the transcription factor called FOXP3, that's why in order to remember, I put the picture of a fox in here. Uh, so there are, now we learned, up, up to six months ago, I thought there was only one type of regulatory, regulatory T cells. 
Now we know there are four types through this article. There are four types of regulatory T cells. One is in thymus, which is important. That's a, I, I explained that there was a computer within. This is the computer in our thymus, which suppress um, any immune reaction against self, but should not suppress immune reaction against not self. Then these cells migrate to the peripheral blood. So there are T-Rex cells in the blood. That's why we call them peripheral T-Rex cells. In the intestine, small intestine, we have one type of T-Rex cells. In the colon, we have another type of T-Rex cells in order to regulate the immune system both in the gut and as well as in the large intestine. So these are the type of cells that we should know, we should know about that play such an important role in uh, protecting us against inflammation and autoimmunity. So right now, so let's take this back to the basics of genes plus three environmental factors are responsible for induction of autoimmunities. So I would like to interject a little bit in here from what we heard from Dr. Muhammad earlier that, and also what I heard at 10th International Congress of Autoimmunity, just scientists doing right now. So talking about the patient with rheumatoid arthritis or thyroid autoimmunity, because lymphocytes who make antibodies are responsible for making these antibodies and antibodies can attack our tissue, what they presented was, let's use some kind of uh, molecules or medication to downregulate the immune system or to block receptors and B cells in order not to produce antibodies. And that was the most advanced message that I heard from these autoimmunologists. But ladies and gentlemen, doctors like Dr. Monroe and other doctors who are practicing in this field, they teach us saying that if Borrelia burgdorferi can cause rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis, no matter how much you try to downregulate the B cells not to produce antibodies, unless you remove the trigger, first identify the trigger, then remove the trigger, then even if you block the B cells, six months later, you'll be in the same place which you used before. So now your patients spend probably $10,000, $50,000, $100,000 uh, in order to uh, suppress the immune system or downregulate the immune system for prevention of autoimmune disease, then you are not going to help your patient unless you remove the triggers. So we are not against what autoimmunologists are doing. We are enhancing that saying that please identify the triggers, then remove the triggers, and then give treatment to your patient. So whether that's uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, or uh, Yersinia enterocolitica, or chlamydia, or mycoplasma, or toxic chemicals, which I'm going to talk about. Let's identify the triggers, remove the triggers, then you enhance the capacity of uh, repairing the patient's uh, abnormalities. So this is another way of looking at the same thing about the role of environmental triggers. In this particular case, the exposomes, what we, we are exposed on a daily basis. So the exposomes can affect our microbiomes. The microbiome can affect our 
genome. The exposome can affect our proteomes. The exposome can affect our metabolome and immunome. And if we don't do anything about that, the end result could be autoimmunome. One of the participants in this international meeting was Aaron Lerner and with his colleague, Professor Matthias, who had presentation at the meeting, but also they published this fascinating article in Journal of Autoimmune Reviews. So what they showed us in this fascinating article that glucose, salt, emulsifier, organic solvents, gluten, microbial transglutaminase, nanoparticles, by the way, lots of medications have nanoparticles on them, are extensively and increasingly used by the food industry. And these individuals claim the manufacturers to improve the quality of food. However, all of the aforementioned additives Increase intestinal permeability, which is the gateway to autoimmunity. So changes in intestinal tight junction permeability associated with industrial food additives explain the rising incidence of autoimmune diseases. So it's not just infections, Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Monroe, the toxic chemicals. For many years, we are talking about it. Now we have more evidence in journals such as autoimmune reviews. So what he showed, actually, that first of all, rheumatic diseases, endocrine, endocrinological, gastrointestinal, neurological. The more we use food additive additives, the more correlation with autoimmune diseases. And this is percent increase every year in different countries and its association with prevalence of autoimmune diseases. What is fascinating in here that the most common autoimmune disease associated with some of these environmental chemicals in our food is the neurological, then gastrointestinal, then endocrinological, then rheumatic. So the nervous system, it seems to be the most sensitive to environmental toxins and induction of autoimmunities. And we knew that for many, many years that I did publish at least seven or eight different articles about levels of antibodies against nervous system antigens in various autoimmune diseases due to exposure to environmental toxins. Now it's good to see that there is association between some of these additives in food and induction of some of these autoimmune diseases. So yes, you were asking me before some of you if we identify a trigger, what can we do about it? The, my answer is educate your patients about, about their diet to remove some of these chemicals. Not to have that food, which can, for example, if contains food colorings. Simple as that. So therefore, there is a lot that we can do. After identifying the triggers, we can remove the trigger and we can repair uh, some of the immune abnormalities. So what he shows again in this slide, this is the last part of his article, was that food industries, bakery, meat, fish, confection, oil, coffee, beverages, others, contain glucose, salt, gluten. That, what is microbial transglutaminase? Anybody knows? Microbial transglutaminase. In America, it's called meat glue. It's an enzyme that you can take lots of um, leftovers of 
meat, glue them together, add some food coloring to it, and make steak that even the butchers cannot differentiate between real steak versus the steak made by meat glue, which is called, in here, called, they, scientifically they call it microbial transglutaminase. That's why your patients, when you do uh, measure antibodies using Array 3 of Cyrex, and your patient is having antibodies against transglutaminase 2 or 3 or 6, ask yourself, maybe my patient is exposed to some of this meat glue. And if I remove that from the diet of the patient, I may be able to reverse that type of autoimmunity in my patient. So therefore, glucosal, meat glue, emulsifiers, organic acids, nanoparticles, all of them have the capacity to open the tight junctions. And look at this expression. They call that autoimmunogenic additives. Autoimmunogenic additives. They have the capacity to open the tight junctions and then induction of autoimmune disease by breaking the tight junctions and activation of the immune system and, and autoimmunities. So what do you see in this picture? If your patient is having autoimmune disease, are you going to give them you know, some, uh, some of these cakes, whatever is in here, made in aluminum? The answer is no. Okay, so why then, or some of, you know, or, or this one? So we have to be more aware that lots of things we do on a daily basis, which we do not, you know, pay attention, but some of these are really become autoimmunogenics. And I have in my pocket example of that right here, right? Espresso. Automated espresso, put it in the machine and then push it down and then you get your espresso. But in the process, you are going to get 50 different environmental toxins in that espresso. So you have to educate your patients about some of this. Novel pebbles in the mosaic of autoimmunity and you see the name right there, Professor Schoenfeld, who organized the Autoimmune Congress in Leipzig. And he talks about some adjuvants, such as aluminum, are recognized as a causal factors in development of the autoimmune response. And an entirely new syndrome, the autoimmune inflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants called Asia, has been recently described. And ladies and gentlemen, what do we have here? Aluminum. So therefore, please pay attention to some of these environmental triggers which are responsible for induction of autoimmunities. And part of my hobby is working in the laboratory. And by the way, I'm hands-on every day. Not only I do research and I do clinical testing, and also, I love to do sometimes uh, this kind of experiments. One day I asked, what is the pH of some of these drinks? So what I found that vinegar is about 2.2, 2.3. And guess what? Pepsi, 2.14. Coca-Cola, 2.21. So my question to your patients will be that how much vinegar can you drink? One spoon, two spoons. So therefore, how come you have a couple liters of Pepsi or Coke every day? You know what happens if you have so much vinegar in your GI tract? You, the tight junctions are going to be opened. And therefore, inflames the gut. And the end result is going to be uh, autoimmunity after several years. So therefore, education, education, education. So now let's take this to the next level. In 1922, Landsteiner and Jacobs introduced the terminology of hapten, being a chemical by itself is not antigenic, 
But when binds to human tissue becomes antigenic and we react against that and we make antibody against that. So here, example of haptin, that's a carrier. For example, our hemoglobin, our albumin. So the haptin, in this case being bisphenol A or aluminum, can bind to our tissue proteins. Now our immune system is going to attack aluminum bound to our own tissue. And so therefore, setting stage for development of autoimmune disease a few years later. So when you remove this trigger, you can prevent immune attack against your own tissue. And a few years later, in 1952, they took some chemicals, applied it to the skin, and then the chemicals could bind to the skin proteins inducing immune reactivity. So that's in 1952. But when it comes to chemicals binding to human tissue, somehow we agree with medication as a cause of allergy or sensitivity. And here, example from textbook of immunology, that penicillin as an antibiotic in certain individuals could get metabolized then bind to our own proteins and form a new antigen. And so therefore reacting against penicillin plus the protein which is penicillin is bound to. Almost 90% of clinicians accept that. But when you change this to another chemical, whether that is formaldehyde or aluminum or bisphenol A, somehow there is some kind of blockage in the understanding, they cannot comprehend that. But this is the same. This is a chemical, aluminum is a chemical, bisphenol A is a chemical. And that's the mechanism of action. So for those who would like to learn a little bit more, please ask them to read this article which was published in Immunology Today, 1998. Drug trafficking, adverse immune response to xenobiotic compounds. So please ask them to read that in order to learn about this whole uh, process because my presentation is evidence-based presentation, like my colleague earlier. So we have the evidence out there. Look at the title of this article by one of another you know, colleague of mine um, from Scripps Clinic in not far from San Diego, Toxicology of Autoimmune Disease. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the meaning of toxicology of autoimmune disease? Meaning toxic chemicals are involved in induction of autoimmune diseases. Simple as that. I'm not going to read any of that anymore. So now, my own research. Elevated levels of antibodies against xenobiotics in a subgroup of healthy subjects. About two years ago, we asked this question. Yes, we know almost all of us exposed to toxic chemicals. And particularly, I'm using heavy metals and bisphenol A. And if, if we'll measure level of bisphenol A in the urine, 97% of the population have very high level of bisphenol A in their urine. But what is the meaning? It's clinically, what is the value of measuring bisphenol A in the urine? Because all of us are exposed. I know I'm exposed to bisphenol A, but to the minimal level. And so therefore, my concern is about those who cannot secrete or excrete the bisphenol A into their urine. If that small amount of that bisphenol A get metabolized 
and bind to human tissue, then that tissue becomes target for autoimmune disease. So we should not measure that in the urine because urine is shows excretion. So I'm interested, as an autoimmunologist, I'm interested in how much chemicals bind to my tissue. So can I take small piece of my brain and measure bisphenol A in my brain tissue? Obviously not. So what choice we have? I explained that in this article. The only choice we have is to measure antibodies against chemicals bound to our own tissue. And that's how they accepted this article for publication. They said the idea is very novel and is challenging the status quo. What is status quo? Measuring chemicals in urine, measuring chemicals in blood. But I'm, I was challenging this whole subject saying that measuring chemicals in the blood and urine is not good enough. Let's look how much chemicals managed to bind to our own tissue, resulting in antibody production against that chemical as well as our own tissue. So therefore, the study was conducted for about 400 healthy subjects. And we wanted to see what percentage of them make antibodies against these various chemicals, which we have tested. The answer was about 20%. And these are healthy subjects today. But don't you think these 20% are more prone to autoimmune disease in the future? If we can detect today and remove those triggers from their environment, we can prevent autoimmune disease in these 20%. So the chemicals that we tested were aflatoxin, which you know it's almost in every single food, many foods, including grains, formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, used as a plasticizer, is not just for pathologists, isocyanide, also used in the paint and as a plasticizer, phthalic anhydride and trimelitic anhydride also as a plasticizer and many, many, many other sources, benzene ring, bisphenol A, bisphenol A binding protein, there is a protein in the brain that bisphenol A covalently can bind to that. It's an enzyme and inducing pr antibody production against our own brain tissue. Tetrabromobisphenol A, tetrachloroethylene, parabens in cosmetics, mercury and other heavy metals, and there are some other chemicals that we are looking at as well. But in this article was about these 12 different chemicals, which is part of Array 11 at Cyrex Laboratories. So, Aflatoxin, why is so important because, why I use aflatoxin? Because people can connect with aflatoxin, like with penicillin. Aflatoxin actually, it, this is part of the textbook of biochemistry that aflatoxin in some individuals goes to the liver and we de detoxify that. But in certain individuals, can bind to our own protein and our own DNA, causing autoimmune reactivity. We are accustomed to look at anti-DNA antibody in patients with lupus. But we don't ask why our patient is making antibody against its own DNA. This is the answer. Some chemicals can bind to the DNA, and the result is antibody production against our own DNA. So we found 17% made antibodies against uh, aflatoxin at two standard deviation above the mean. This is the, you know, the normal ranges. Right here you see lots of people who made some antibodies but they were not that high. But about 17% made significantly high levels of antibodies. And in my opinion, these are the individuals who are more prone to autoimmune disease. 
The same thing with formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. I don't have time to go through some of, you know, uh, details in here where you can find all of that. But we found 13% reacted to formaldehyde. Um, isocyanide. Uh, again, we found 14%. Trimelitic anhydride, phthalic anhydride. Um, the same percentage almost. Now, this article was published in, um, uh, I think it's uh, in, yeah, Environmental Health Perspective. What is Environmental Health Perspective journal? It's official journal of um, National Institute of Environmental Health in North Carolina, part of National Institute of Health. So it's the most reliable source. What do they tell us in this article that um, reducing chemical migration in food contact material Till now, I thought that you have to have like liquid in a plastic bottle in order bis bisphenol A or other chemicals to get into the liquid which we drink it. Now in this article showing us that it is enough to put, for example, a piece of salmon in a plastic dish. Just by contact, chemicals from that plastic can get it into the salmon, then we cook the salmon, and we have the salmon plus bisphenol A. That's what they are telling us in this article. And that's why they put some of these pictures. So some of these pictures that tuna versus some of these uh, you know, cans, even some of these cartons we are using for purchasing milk, whatever, there's a lot of contamination. A lot of chemicals can get into that milk or other products. So therefore, education, education, education. And so we found 12% reacted to trimelitic anhydride. And then the bisphenol A, you know, a few years ago, they told us that let's change the structure of bisphenol A, change a metal to another group, and then the same plastic introduced to us with different marketing plans. So everybody was saying, OK, now I'm using bisphenol A free plastic. This article is telling us that this is rubbish, right? In, in England, you are saying that in the UK, it's rubbish. So it is the same thing. It's like medications. Companies are changing a little bit structure of certain uh, medication. They introduce it for another 20 years, but it's the same medication. So in here, I'm saying that plastic is plastic, no matter how it's made. And, and uh, this is from Science 2015. So what is wrong with these plasticizers, such as bisphenol A? Okay, so we call these endocrine disruptors. What are endocrine disruptors? They interfere with the endocrine function. And here is an, a cell has a receptor. The hormone bind to the receptor. When the re hormone bind to the receptor, activate several cascades of events. Several cascades of events occur and signals go through and cell function is triggered. So hormone bind to its receptor, then ends with cell functionality. So, so far you are with me, right? So now what will happen if this is the hormone and this is bisphenol A, and this is real. So bisphenol A now binds to the cell receptor and the hormone cannot bind, compete with that. And the signal is not the same signal. The end result will be 
abnormal cell function. Function, cell function interference. In some cases, that the chemical looks like hormone blocker. We call that xenobiotics. The same thing, binds to the receptor, and hormone cannot bind, and therefore cell function interference. Simple as that. That's why endocrine disruptors can cause autoimmunity such as uh, thyroid autoimmunity uh, and other, other autoimmune diseases. That's the mechanism. So we found 26%, the highest, 26% of the population, healthy subjects, made antibodies against bisphenol A. And that's only IgG. We measured also IgM. We measured also IgA. If we add those, we'll get about 40% of the population reacted to bisphenol A and made antibody against that, meaning Chemicals are not in and out. Chemicals and their metabolites can bind to human tissue and causing or setting the stage to development of autoimmune disease. And then with one of my colleagues, this is an article just we wrote recently, we just sent for publication, Let's look at the title. Correlation between antibodies to bisphenol A, its target enzyme, disulfide isomerase, enzyme in the brain, and antibodies to neuron-specific antigen, such as myelin basic protein, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. So what we show that, that if a patient is making antibody against bisphenol A, the patient also is making antibody against its target enzyme in the brain. So there is direct association between antibody against enzyme in our brain versus bisphenol A. Then the next question was, how about antibodies against myelin basic protein, which are some kind of biomarkers for detection of neuroimmune disorders. And the same thing, we found direct correlation. And there are many more slides like myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein and all of that. So it is much more complicated than what we think. You get exposed to some of these plasticizer or other chemicals. Chemicals can change the integrity of the gut. Chemicals can change the structure of our proteins. We react against them. We make antibodies against those tissues, including various brain tissue antigens. And therefore, the end result could be autoimmunity, including neuroautoimmunity, meaning autoimmunity against our own brain tissue. OK. now. Just look at the title of this article, Bisphenol Exposure in Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder. They found a correlation between exposure to bisphenol A versus autism. And something is very interesting in here that, that you see here total bisphenol A. This is Autism versus control. There is a significant difference between these. But when you look at the person bound bisphenol A, that's exactly what I was talking about. When bisphenol A bound to our tissue, 59, okay, 59 in autism control only four units. So there is a huge difference, statistically, extremely, extremely huge difference between Autism versus healthy subjects, therefore chemicals can bind to our tissue and setting the stage for neurobehavioral disorder, not just autoimmunity. Again, look at the title of this article. Lots of colleagues, lots, lots of doctors are calling saying that, doctor, how come 
that 20 years ago, people were not reacting to the food they were eating. How come so many are reacting to the food that they are eating? This is one of the answers. That the food that we eat is contaminated with many chemicals. Chemicals bound to the protein of the food. And then when we consume that, our oral tolerance, our T-Rex cell is not working properly. And so therefore, food intolerance at adulthoods after prenatal exposure to endocrine disruptors bisphenol A. So here they're telling that if the mother is exposed to bisphenol A and the child within is exposed to bisphenol A, that child is going to develop food immune reactivity in the future because his or her T-Rex cell is not going to work. Thyroid hormonal activity of the flame retardant and one of the items that we tested antibody was, was tetrabromobisphenol A and tetrachlorobisphenol A. And we are familiar with this for 30, 40 years. Now the evidence is coming out one after another. So some of these chemicals, meaning, have, are associated with thyroid dysfunction that we find in such a high percentage of the teenagers these days, in particular girls. So tetrabromobisphenol A, this is the structure. If I'll put thyroid hormone structure right here, almost 90% identical. That's the mechanism. So it's not just cross-reactivity between infection with human tissue. There is antigenic similarity between different chemicals with our thyroid hormones, other hormones. Therefore, uh, some of these chemicals are responsible for induction of autoimmunities. So we found 15% uh, reacted to tetrabromobisphenol A. Parabens in cosmetics uh, is responsible also for so many problems, and therefore we found 13%. Then heavy metals. Again, look at the title. How can a chemical element elicit complex immunopathology lessens from mercury-induced autoimmunity? This is in a journal called Trends in Immunology, 2009. It's not anymore you know, questioning whether heavy metals and mercury can cause autoimmunity. They are explaining what is the mechanism of chemical induction of autoimmunity. And so here, the picture saying the individual exposed to mercury, the mercury can penetrate the cell membrane. bind to nucleoproteins, cell goes through apoptosis or cell dies, now releasing all the contents. What is that content? Nucleoprotein plus mercury bound to each other. So antigen presenting cell that will take that up. Our immune system is going to react to what? Our nucleoprotein plus the toxic chemical. And this is the mechanism of mercury or other chemical induction of autoimmunities. And mercury, we found 14%. And I'm going to present to you guys this case, and I will conclude my presentation. OK, so a case report. A case report of 20 six-year-old female working as a, in a beauty salon, get married at age 28, by age 35, three children, 156 pounds. Complaints of severe migraine headaches, fatigue, and fibromyalgia. Their yearly checkup CBC, chemistry, anti-nuclear antibodies, urinalysis, T3, T4, TSH, almost everything normal. To find the cause of weight gain and symptoms, 
visits four different doctors. And they linked or associated the weight gain and some of these symptoms with probably pregnancies and low thyroid function. By age 45, gained additional 23 pounds, developed severe allergies with rashes and uh, itching, particularly after showering. That's really very important. Just That's huge message right there. She visits three different allergists. This time she goes to the specialist. Allergist, classical skin testing, one positive reaction to ragweed, but it, that's not associated with her symptomatology. Lab tests, this time, TSH is low, anti-nuclear antibodies. Remember the issue of mercury. Why we make antibodies against our own nuclear material? That's the question always we have to ask. And none of the doctors associated her symptoms with her occupation. So ladies and gentlemen, clinicians always should ask the patient, what is your profession? Very important. The following summer, she went for vacation in Hawaii. All symptoms improved by 80%. And even while on vacation, she lost 10 pounds. She finally, she, the patient, connected the dots and decided to make a diary of her daily work activities. But one week after returning to work, all symptoms are back. So she went for vacation, symptoms disappeared. Back to work, symptoms are back. And also she notes that symptoms lessen if she only cuts hair but she experienced severe symptoms when she does hair dyeing, particularly Brazilians, which you know how many chemicals are introduced by doing that. After connecting her symptoms to her work environment, she consults a doctor specializing in environmental medicine, Dr. Monroe. Oops, sorry. So after connecting her symptoms to her work environment, she consults a doctor specializing in environmental medicine. At age 49 or 14 years later, a doctor finally associate the patient's occupation and her weight gain, allergies, anti-nuclear antibodies or autoimmunities. The specialist order array two for leaky gut, orders array 11 for chemical antibody and array 7 for neurologic antibodies. And let me share the results with you. So what you see in here that the patient is making very high levels of antibodies against occluding zonulin, right? 5.1, that's normal range is 1.5, and also IgM. So there is an issue with leaky gut in this patient, number one. Number two, chemical antibodies. There are some problems with aflatoxin, yes, but the main problem are with uh, isocyanide, triamylytic anhydride, those are plasticizers, chemicals also in, a, you know, in beauty salon and other chemicals, tetrachloroethylene and parabens. So all these chemicals which are found in her environment, she made antibody against that. If 15 years before that would have done these panels, one could find correlation between some of these chemicals, she was working with them on a daily basis, and her symptomatology. And then looking at antibodies against myelin basic protein, acyaloganglioside, tubulin, cerebellar, synapsin, tubulin, and blood-brain barrier protein, 
The blue is the normal ranges, and the red is the patient. You'll see she made antibodies against her own nervous system antigen. If this patient would, you know, if this patient will continue working in the same environment after five or 10 years, or five to 10 years later, most probably it's going to develop full-blown multiple sclerosis because all these antibodies are early biomarkers of autoimmunity, particularly neuroautoimmunity. So all of those were abnormal. So based on the test, detection of many abnormalities, he sent the patient to two weeks of detoxification program. There's an institute not far from San Diego, which I have been there, San Aviv Institute. And then they, you know, they treat the patient with uh, all kind of, uh, you know, uh, sauna and uh, colon therapy and all of that. Of course, the patient could not come to the UK to see uh, Dr. Monroe, but that was the best she could do. And then uh, she feels much, much better. Um, she takes all kind of uh, um, supplements to detoxify. And now she's back at work doing only haircuts and happy to have finally found the root cause of her problems. So therefore, once the root cause of trigger was detected, she was able to remove the cause and then repair her health by following the, some kind of protocol that I don't have it in here, but I'll give you the summary. So number one is really you have to have the capacity to detect. You have to have the right biomarkers to detect the problem at the early stage as possible. When you detected the problems, then remove the triggers. The triggers could be infection, the triggers could be toxic chemicals. The trigger could be certain food. Gluten is not the only one. There are many others could be responsible. That's why our RA10 is so important to be tested for. And then finally, you can repair the barriers. And at the beginning of my talk, I showed you the pyramid, right? The pyramid of autoimmunity. Now let's reverse the pyramid which is V, Vojdani, my last name, okay? So now what do you see in here? This is really the, if you take the pyramid and this one will be the most important two slides to remember in my talk, okay? So what we have in here that, on this side we have breaching the barriers, here we have repairing the barriers. Why that's important? Because this is the root cause of Autoimmunity, the barriers, breach in barrier is the gateway to autoimmunity. So what we have in here, low secretory IgA, uh, low or high acid in the stomach, uh, inactive, well, thin layer of mucus in, the, uh, in our uh, mucosal immune system, inactive digestive enzymes, uh, undigested dietary peptides, undigested lectins and agglutinin, so gluten is not the only one, high salt diet, high sugar diet, artificial food coloring, emulsifiers, organic solvents, nanoparticles, uh, meat glue, lipopolysaccharides from E. coli and others, yeast proteases, and medications, all of these together can cause breach in the barriers, which can result in inflammation and autoimmunity. So how can we reverse this? And on the other side, we have here vitamin A or retinoic acid. Why vitamin A and retinoic acid? Because the same T-Rex cells in the gut has receptors for vitamin A. By giving vitamin A to your patients, you are going to activate the T-Rex cells to regulate the immune system. Next, vitamin D3. The same cell is having receptors for vitamin D. 
See, when you understand the mechanism, then you can convince your patients why they should take vitamin A and vitamin D. AHR ligands. In here, it's written indole tricarbinol. What is that? There are certain foods, such as cruciferous vegetables, contain AHR ligands. T-Rex cells also is having receptors for AHR ligands. That's why it's so important, in addition to vitamin, A, vitamin D, to take uh, cruciferous vegetables. And high potency probiotics, fiber complex carbohydrates or complex carbohydrates, fibers such as zillium, hemp, flaxseed, that's what I'm taking every morning. And then activators of toll-like receptors in the gut, digestive enzymes, we have to take glutamine, N-acetylcysteine, fish oil, EPA, DHA, Saccharomyces boulardii, oil of oregano, gelatin, or bone broth. It's very good for digestive tract. Vitamin A, vitamin C, and zinc. So ladies and gentlemen, this is from A to Z, but in between you can add more. Remove some or add some. And so therefore, from A to Z is very important for repairing the barrier and prevent many autoimmune diseases which affecting 10% of the world population. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, it's question time. So if anyone has any questions, now's your opportunity. Dr. Dowd is there if... Uh... Oh. Anyone want to ask questions? Or you actually got some back Anyone have any questions? Because I'm not a medical person. Just green. Yeah. Ah, great. Thank you very much. What was the question? Yeah, you mentioned about packaging for like tin for plastic bottles and everything. So if you're buying like healthy water right at a supermarket in a bottle. Is that still the same thing? You can get contagions from the plastic bottle? Absolutely, yes. Uh, um, uh, so if you, if, well, fortunately, what I have found in Europe, in Germany, and the UK, that you guys are drinking in glass bottles, most of you. In America, probably 90% of people are drinking from plastic bottles. That's a very bad practice. In here is much, much better practice. So I honestly, I prefer to drink tap water than to drink from plastic bottle, even if they think the water is clean. But you know, just imagine how long that water was kept in that bottle. One year, two years, three years. So that would be worse than what. And so therefore, some of those chemicals get into the water, and we drink it. So what about the chemicals that are put in our water, like fluoride and stuff like this? Well, well, at, at least I'm <laughs> saying that there are certain things that we cannot prevent. But there are certain items we can prevent. And one of them is, let's not consume more bisphenol A if we, can have, if we have a choice of drinking from glass bottles. So, so if we get the water in the glass bottle from the supermarket, it's better than the plastic then? Yes. Right. <laughs> and that's true of water. It's true of other things as well, of course. Unfortunately, milk yeah. goes into cover glass bottles very much. Any questions? No. Yeah. Yeah. Same problem, isn't it, sir? Milk in plastic bottles. Oh, oh, oh okay. Remember three things that we sh never sh we sh should not do. One, fat and plastic. So milk has fat, right? And that milk, the inside of that uh, box is coated with bisphenol A. So bisphenol A get dissolved in fat much faster than in water. So number one is, so for example, 
never buy oil in plastic. Always all oil should be in a glass bottle. Why? Because chemicals dissolve in oil first. Second one is heat. Higher temperature, chemicals get dissolved much faster. Number three, alcohol and plastic. Alcohol dissolving in the plastic, and so therefore, please, if you enjoy your alcohol, at least drink it in a glass uh, container and not plastic. Those are the three items always we should avoid. Add to that? Uh, I'm just going to say here, um, they've started selling olive oil in plastic bottles, which I was very saddened by. In this country, yeah. Yeah. Um, could I ask how um, salt affects the, you said a high salt diet affects the um, intestinal barrier? Could yes. you explain how, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, there are type of cells in our gut called T helper 17. T helper 17 act exactly opposite to T rex cells. High salt diet activates T helper 17, which are more pathogenic and autoimmunogenic. If you are interested to read an article in a journal called Autoimmune Disease, under Vojdani, the mechanism is under my name. I don't know, it wasn't in here. So if you go online, just Vojdani, the role of environmental triggers in autoimmune diseases. You will find that article. And so I explained the mechanism how high salt diet activates T helper 17s, which are responsible for the induction of autoimmunities. That's why high consumption of salt is associated with higher levels of autoimmunities. I, th I thought we needed salt to produce hydrochloric acid for us in our stomach to digest food, especially protein. S okay. Some, some of us, we have low stomach acid. We need to take HCL with the enzymes. Yeah. Some of us, we may have high stomach acid. So we have to be careful about that. It's not good for everybody mm. to take HCL with digestive enzymes. So if we had a, a low salt diet, had, had we, without taking, say, betaine HCL, how would we make the stomach acid without salt? Uh, well, minimal amount of salts, regardless, can get into our body. Mm -hmm. If you remove completely salt, not to add salt to your food, you are going to get between 8 to 100 grams a day. Just by eating normal food. So that is enough for our functionality. But unfortunately, in the US, China, and other countries, they are using between 15 to 20 grams a day of salt, which is activating the T-Rex cells and could, could be responsible for some of the autoimmune diseases. And could you explain why some people do not produce enough if, if we if we all get enough salt in our diet, can you explain why some people produ don't produce enough stomach acid? Uh, that's because, okay, we have parietal cell yeah. in our GI tract, in our stomach, are responsible for making acid. Mm -hmm. And if, for example, I drink Pepsi, which is so much acidic, mm -hmm. and causing destruction of some of those cells or their functionality, now, my cells are not going to produce hydrochloric acid. Therefore, I'll end up with low HCL. And therefore, I need to take supplements mm. with enzymes plus hydrochloric acid. Is, is that a temporary effect? I'm sorry? If you drink uh, lots of Coke or Pepsi, would, would that, is that a permanent effect or just temporary? It's, it's temporary. The, the good news is that the body is victorious, mm. that after one day or two days, the body can rebuild itself. Yes. Are there any, anything, any other um, drinks or foods that do the same thing? Uh, well, depends on their pH. Okay. Yes, depends on their pH. What I showed in here, 
the pH was highly, highly acidic. 2.1, 2.2, 3 mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have questions, including if you want to ask? Any of Dr. Van? Um, you talked about the chemicals binding to the receptors, um, which prevents then the hormones from um, to having, having the, the appropriate action on the cell. Can the, can the chemicals also bind to the hormones directly to stop them being able to bind into the receptor? That's a very good question. Years ago, I published an article about hormone antibodies. How can we make antibodies against our own hormones? So maybe this is one of the reasons that chemicals can bind to the hormones and therefore we make antibodies against our own hormones and some people end up with infertility because of that. And so it, it, everything is possible, yes. Thank you for asking that. Anybody else have a question? No? Well, thank you both very much. Could yeah, thank you. Back, could you just go back to your slide that had the triangle with the um, three R, not three R's, the the, the first one. Let's well, see. If, one, one. I know this third one. Let's we'll see if we can. No, not that one. The last but one, which was. Um, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. Eliminating the pair. Yeah, that's the one. I think that's a very, very important slide. And again, it comes back to what I think we're trying to achieve. Most of the problems, and it's one of the reasons why we as an organization are fairly closely associated with Breakspear, because Breakspear do things on this basis that most clinics and most GPs don't even know about, let alone attempt to do. You've got to detect how many GPs could do the sort of detection that's done here? You've got to remove the triggers. Well, once you've detected them, you have a better chance of removing them, haven't you? Not easy, but you can certainly get rid of them or minimize them, even if you can't remove them. And thirdly, repair them. And that's the last good bit of news. These things are often repairable. Some of the people that suffer from these things don't have to always suffer from them. They are repairable. This is what we're trying, the story we're trying to get across to a wider audience. So, Anybody that knows anybody about, wants to know about this, ask them to come onto our website in a few months' time and you can pick all this up. So, thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen. Environmental Medicine Foundation. I think at the moment it's probably .org.uk. It will be very soon if it isn't that now. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Maybe you'll come again. We will, we will advise you of any further, and there will be further meetings a bit like this on other topics associated with these sorts of uh, situations. So uh, watch this space, as they say. Thank you. Thank you.